So you are, now you're being recorded, Seder. Okay, then I will start this seminar. Thank you, everybody, to join us uh, in this uh, now weekly uh, geological research seminar. And we have the pleasure to um, welcome Heather Stewart from the British Geological Survey today. Um, just a small biography, uh, Heather uh, graduated uh, in, as a Master in Geology at the University of Glasgow, uh, 2001. And then I think pretty pretty shortly afterwards, uh, she started at BGS and, and now as, is there as a, a ranking senior uh, marine geologist. And of course, we are not too unfamiliar with each other. We have already worked together, BGS and, and, and um, the Department of Geology have worked already uh, a lot with each other uh, in the past decades, previous century as well. That's something that Marc de Batiste did then at that time. Um, and then, so now uh, the last time we, we really worked together was within the framework of Tim Collard's uh, PhD, where we embarked two times on, on the Belgica. But the story of today will be something that unfortunately we cannot do yet from the present Belgica, but maybe with the next one we could try to do it. Um, but I, I will leave it uh, up to Heather because I think it will be a very exciting story. So please, Heather, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much. So I'll, I'll just turn off my video and um, share my screen. So bear with me a, a little second. So hopefully you can see the, uh, not the presenter view, but the, the proper view. Yeah, thumb up. Yep, cool, excellent. So um, thanks very much for the, the introduction and, and of course the, the invite. Um, yeah, it's good to, to be back at University of Ghent, even if it is virtual. Um, I have spent a bit of time over the years there and it's I very much uh, like collaborating with you all. Um, so as David said, uh, my regular stomping grounds are the waters around about the UK and the North Atlantic. Um, and of course, a couple of trips on the, the wonderful ship Belgica. But uh, over the last seven years ago or so, um, I've been lucky enough to participate in a number of projects exploring the deepest reaches of our planet, including subduction zones and oceanic ridges. And um, so I think, yeah, uh, since about 2015, I've, I've done eight expeditions to these ultra deep areas. And, um, and because of that experience and um, the work coming out of that work and 2018 and 2019, I was lucky enough to be expedition geologist for the five deeps. And um, today I'm going to take you on a, a bit of a whistle stop tour of the deepest parts of our oceans. I'll cherry pick some of the research highlights along the way, but um, I hope you enjoy uh, the presentation and we'll hopefully have some time for some questions at the end. So um, just a, a quick background. Um, the five deeps was conceived and driven by a, a Texan private equity investor called Victor Vescovo and um, he was an adventurer uh, well not was is it's not like he's died so he's alive <laughs> he's an explorer and adventurer who had previously completed the explorer's grand slam which is climbing the seven highest peaks on the seven continents and he'd also skied to the north and south poles so um after he'd sort of done that and he was sitting at home a bit bored I think um he sort of he was ex-US uh, Navy as well, so he started to look towards the oceans and he basically wanted to become, you know, he is a very goal-driven individual and he wanted to become the first person to dive solo to the deepest point in five oceans. So, I mean, first things first, um, there was a couple of issues, you know, do we really know where these deep points are and do we have a vehicle that could get him down there? You know, basically, you know, these are a couple of fundamental questions um, you need to ask ahead of any fieldwork expedition where are you going and why and what do you want to learn and do you have the equipment that you need in order to achieve your obje objectives so um i suppose a bit unusually um with this expedition or, or series of expeditions usually when we go offshore and i'm sure you know david kuhn and mark and everybody have, have been telling you you know you can have any sort of research-based field work you know you you have a, a, a hypothesis that you're wanting to test you know you you get your equipment together and you go out and, and test that whereas here there was a guy he already had a goal and wanting to do so then we were sort of coming along and it was a fantastic opportunity that you couldn't pass up because we were going to get access to a ship that was going around the world and so we were kind of adding all of the science on every single step of the way as we were going ocean to ocean 
So um, just a, a little bit of background briefly, you know, the, the best available global company compilation today for the bathymetry of the oceans is, is JEBCO. There are um, other compilations as well. I use um, the GMRT, which the reference is, is at the bottom there as well, a lot for my research. Um, but when you look at this, you can get a sort of false sense of achievement. It's all covered. There's nothing left to explore. We know it all about our deep oceans. But if we start to look in detail at the pretty picture, and as researchers, we should always question the sources, um, we can start to interrogate the data behind the grid. And when we do that, this is the, the source grid um, for, for JEBCO, um, for the, the bathymetric coverage. You know, again, even at this scale, the world ocean appears much better covered with ship soundings and direct observations than it actually is. So the, the blocks of colour, you know, the, the block of colour over the poles there, the sort of um, pale pink and the, the pale blue, you know, these represent sort of bathymetric compilations themselves that have been included in JEBCO, rather than representing large areas of high resolution direct measurements. So um, the fact is, is that if you look at JEBCO, um, there's only depth control points in 18% of all of the grid cells and each grid cell is a kilometer across you know so if you sort of think you know I, I live in in Edinburgh in Scotland I'm from the Highlands you know so if I went home to my home village and I walked a kilometer from my parents house that I grew up in I would change elevation significantly over a really short distance you know so is that one depth control point every kilometer really truly representative of the the dynamics and the, the complexity of our ocean floors and in fact if we kind of look at it a bit more um, these are taking only the high resolution multi-beam bathymetry lines available globally so a lot of these white areas they're infilled with sort of sporadic individual ship soundings single beam data and also um, satellite altimetry data. And um, I mean, the satellite data have taught us a great deal about, um, about the, the shape of the, the Earth's ocean. So it's not to take away from that amazing body of work, but um, that's uh, if you, satellite altimetry data, if you don't know, certain spacecraft carry um, altimeter instruments that can infer CPEG topography, um, C, yeah, seafloor uh, topography from the way that Earth's gravity sculpts the water surface above features such as sea mounts. So, um, and that's where you get your, a lot of your one kilometer resolution information. So again, just to reiterate, the, the, the take home message from this map is that, you know, 80% of our oceans have still really got to be covered to any sort of greater resolution than, than what is available from satellites. So, um, so as I said, you know, um, Victor wanted to reach the, the five deepest places in the five oceans. But when um, I started talking to him back in 2017, we realized that we didn't actually know where those deep points are. So we published a desk study um, just addressing this very question, which was a lot of fun, actually, because you get to dig into old records from ships spanning the, the 19th, 20th, 21st centuries. You come across issues with naming conventions. It's a very human thing to do is that you, you find something and you name it. You name it after your, your ship or your, you know, king, queen, monarch, you know, the, the, the first officer on the bridge, the blacksmith on board, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different names for a lot of deeps. But I mean, are these really sort of confined deeps? Are these really the deepest places in the world? So we discovered that areas like the Pacific and Atlantic, you know, the deepest point was pretty well nailed down. Um, so uh, there was minor issues around, you know, is Horizon Deep in the Tonga Trench actually a little bit deeper than, than the Mariana Trench and Challenger Deep? Um, and for a long time, it was thought that Tonga Trench was the deepest place in the world. Um, and the depths between Challenger Deep and Horizon Deep are within only before we went there about 100 meters anyway so that, I mean that's really within the error margin of a lot of deep water systems you know especially you know sort of older systems and even in places like the the Indian Ocean um you know is the deepest point in the Java Trench or is it in the Diamantina Fracture Zone and again the, the difference between what we could do with our desk study 
um, and what we could discover was within the error margin of a lot of a lot of systems acquisition systems. So there was still a bit of work to do um, and, and uh, discoveries to be made. So um, of course, that's knowing the where you want to go. Um, that's one thing. So we could give that to the people that are planning all the logistics and they could plan the ship's journey around the world, taking into account weather windows and so on. But um, we need a vehicle in order to take Victor down there. Um, so the first descent into the, the sort of what we call full ocean depth, which is down to Challenge Deep, of course, was in uh, 1960. And it was uh, Don Walsh and, and Jacques Picard went down in the Bathyscaf Trieste. Um, and the, their descent took nearly five hours. And once the, the Bathyscaf Trieste, once it reached the seafloor, they spent a little bit of time observing their, their um, surroundings, but they couldn't maneuver across the seafloor. So it was a strictly up and down job. Um, and they only spent 20 minutes on the seafloor. Um, and their ascent, um, once they dropped their weights, um, on, uh, I think it took three hours and 15 minutes. So nowadays um, they used uh, gasoline tank, uh, gasoline filled tanks for flotation to bring them back up to the sea surface once they were ready to come home. So nowadays we use syntactic foam, which um, has sort of replaced all of that gasoline. Um, so since then, only uh, ROVs had made it to, the, to Challenger Deep until 26th of March 2012. And that was the, the, the adventurer, explorer and famous director, James Cameron. Everybody loves a bit of Terminator, don't they? Um, so James Cameron um, went down and he built and piloted the deep sea Challenger submersible. And you can see that the shape is very different from the sort of Bathyscaphe Trieste. Um, it's designed to go up and down through the water column very quickly. And in fact, he only took two hours and 36 minutes to get down to full ocean depth from the sea surface. Um, he spent around three hours on the sea floor um, and recording video, uh, looking at the, at the communities down there and the, and the geology. Um, and in total, he did a number, uh, he did five dives, um, generating a lot of video of undisturbed deep sea communities at sort of 1,000 metres water depth, uh, 3,700 metres water depth. And he also did a Hadal dive. So Hadal is anything exceeding 6,000 metres water depth um, in the New Britain Trench, as well as um, uh, the Mariana Trench. So um, that work has been published by um, Gallo in 2015 in Deep Sea Research. And, um, and afterwards, James Cameron always expected that somebody else would take on the submarine that could be used for science um, afterwards. But unfortunately, when he donated it to science, it caught fire um, when it was being transported to Woods Hole. So it was lost to science. It was on the back of a truck and yeah, not quite sure what exactly happened, but well, not good. <laughs> um, so uh, of course, you know, so all of these vehicles, um, there are other submarines, of course, you know, like Alvin um, and so on, but they didn't go full ocean depth. So Victor had to go to Triton submarines to get um, one built. And, um, and it was designed by a, a British uh, guy, John Ramsey, and built by, uh, by Triton submarines. There's a link in the top right there. Um, so it's a, a short little video. I think it's about 10, 15 minutes maybe. And it, it shows you how they forged the titanium sphere, which you can see, it looks like a little sort of funny face in the bottom right there. Um, because there wasn't actually the technique to forge the sphere um, well, certainly in America, they had to take it over to, to Russia to get it sort of pressure tested and stuff. So, um, yeah, so check out the little, um, the little documentary if you have time. Um, just to, to quickly take through the, the entire sort of uh, submarine has got a titanium frame that everything's bolted onto. Um, across the top, you've got your, your entrance and exit trunk, of course. That's about the height that I am, and I'm about 1.8 metres high. So just to get down to the, to the sphere, um, you've got communications and, and sonar and stuff across the top of the submarine um, and, and batteries down, the, the sort of heavy things are all down near the bottom, so your batteries and your, your weights. And if you look at this sort of slightly sort of side on view, you can see it's shaped like a teardrop kind of. And again, like James Cameron, it was to facil facilitate really quick journeys up and down through the water column to really try and minimize the your your sort of dive cycle time. But um but unlike the 
the, the sort of Trieste, for example. But like James Cameron, we had external, well, have external thrusters that allows, allows us to actually traverse the seafloor um, and, and investigate um, features of interest. Um, I won't go into too much uh, detail. There's a tank at the top, which you fill with seawater when you're wanting to sink. And then when you come back home, you pump all that seawater out and, and um, it's a, an air cavity, a flotation cavity. And there's a manipulator arm as well. Um, just super quick, uh, as well as the, the submarine, we did have, uh, do have uh, three full ocean depth landers and we can use them to acquire samples, both biological and if we pick anything up with the manipulator arm in the submarine, it means that we can take cores using the arm and, and put rocks and things in the boxes. Uh, there's uh, CTD information, water samplers, you know, so we, we've got that as a scientific instrument but primarily it's used for navigation and communication for the, the sub. And we put it all in a ship and, um, and took it around the world for 10 months, uh, covering 46,000 miles. The main thing which I will focus on is this EM124. So um, it was the first one built by Kongsberg. I did say to them, I was like, you never take the very first one. You wait until it's the next one. You never buy the first one. Just get an EM122, it will be fine. And they were like, oh, we want the best, you know. So they got this brand new system, which we took out. And um, and it had its teething issues, as you might expect, but uh, it came good in the end. It was um, fantastic. But as a geologist, I look at a lot of geomorphology, for example. So this was really my sort of workhorse um, in terms of uh, ongoing research. So um, we went to, to Puerto Rico, um, which was the first trip. Uh, it, was, it was a little bit tense at times. There was a lot of different groups on board, a lot of new technology that although had been tested, you know, we had um, uh, sort of field tests and things, you know, but whenever you start to send it down to eight and a half thousand meters, you know, things can get a little bit tense. Um, we also had a documentary team. You can see there's a, once you get your eye in, you start to see a whole pile of video cameras and things, which added another dimension to the relationships on board. But um, anyway, it was, it was uh, a bit of a balancing act between all of the, the different teams on board. Uh, communication, of course, is key, respect and compromise where possible. But I mean, we were all sort of getting to know each other. Um, you know, the science team, the engineering teams, the documentary teams, you know, the, we had journalists and artists and so on on board. But let's uh, look at the, at the actual kind of geology and, and, uh, and science. So um, it was the first trial of the, the M122. This image is actually existing data. So we didn't survey. That would take months and months and months to survey the entire Puerto Rico trench. So as part of the data mining exercise, I, I dug out as much as I could. But, um, but just to sort of highlight that um, a change in subduction style uh, along the trench axis, you know, it, it's much more like a sort of traditional subduction, you know, one plate getting thrust under the other to the east. So you get this classic sort of stepped um, descent into the, the trench axis on the, the incoming plate with the overriding plate um, forming a really nice accretionary uh, prism um, against that. But as you move west, and you can see just from this image that the seafloor west is much smoother. Um, you could call it featureless or certainly less topographically dynamic than the, the east. It opens up like a flower. But the subduction style has changed in this sort of sector of the of the trench. It becomes much more sort of strike slip with only a minor component of subduction going on, and that's reflected in the in the sort of more slightly less interesting geology, some might say. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, before um, we went out, I did do a bit of uh, work just looking at, at some of the surface faults and uh, looking up through the, the literature. All of the white lines there are bend related faulting. So as the plate, the incoming plate is coming in and being flexed downward underneath um, the, the Caribbean plate. I'm forgetting the plate tectonics now. Anyway, um, it, it bends and it fractures and you get these wonderful escarpments um, and I'll, I'll describe them a bit more um, later on. So, um, oops, oh, come on. Uh, so we went there just before Christmas in um, 2018 um, 
we had already identified that that open area in the in the west was where the deepest parts of the the trench were so we used the it was a good trial for the em124 because we had quite good data control there already so it was really good to sort of overlap that with the new system and just sort of compare and contrast and put the em124 through its paces and um we measured sort of initially uh, the data uh, the data study previous to us arriving there had put the deepest depth about 8,400 metres. And so the EM124 proved that just to be a little bit shallower, 8,378. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was a bit of a relief, to be honest, you know, a lot of new technology on board. Whenever you take new technology offshore, there's always a certain degree of stress. <laughs> um, so we actually managed to do it and, um, and, and we trundled off to the Southern Ocean. Um, taking on board all of the lessons that we'd sort of learned in Puerto Rico. Um, I have to admit, I've got a few kind of holiday snaps now. Um, if anybody, I know that uh, a number of you have already been down south, but certainly the, the, the student cohort listening today, if you ever get the opportunity to travel to the polar regions, do it, just do it, do it, do it. It's like you're in a, you know, Discovery Channel documentary, it's wonderful. And um, this, when we arrived in South Georgia, it was the first day it hadn't rained in, I think, two months solid. So it was just, we were incredibly lucky. Um, and when you're working down there, I mean, it is just, I mean, these guys were just next to our boat. You know, it's just, you know, there's penguins, there's whales, you know, and icebergs, you know, and it's, and that isn't even the biggest one that we saw. You know, it's just, I mean, it's absolutely fantastic. And it is hard when you're working on, on board ships, you know, just sort of generally, you know, there's always, there's good days and there's bad days. But then on the bad days, you just open your eyes, look up, look outside your little bit that you're getting all angry about, and you realise that you're bloody lucky to have the job that you do. So anyway, that's just my little sort of opinion on things. But back to point, um, as I said, some of the areas we plan to visit had um, some data available already, but the South Sandwich Trench in the Southern Ocean um, wasn't one of them. Um, it was only covered by pretty poor quality, actually, even by satellite data standards um, information. And you only get really a sort of general feel for the shape of the seafloor. You know, all you can really sort of tell is that it's an arcuate trench. That's it. Um, so the, the sort of deepest point could be anywhere along the entire trench axis. But um, there's also the issue of where the definition of where the Southern Ocean starts depends on the expert that you talk to. If you talk to a physical oceanographer, it of course fluctuates seasonally um, to a point sort of north of uh, the South Georgia to a, a point way south of the entire trench. So, I mean, a bit of an issue. So in the end, we took what um, the, the International Hydrographic Office put it and where the Antarctic Treaty put it, because um, you've got to draw a line somewhere, don't you? And so we put it at sort of 60 degrees south as advised by all of these people. I know I can see Mark's face, he's looking shocked. <laughs> but, um, you know, for the, the purposes of this, you know, we had to, to put a definition somewhere. And so we took the definition by others. We didn't make that decision, other people did. <laughs> but, um, but it did mean that the deepest point in the Southern Ocean was just in the very Southern sort of little blip of the, of the trench. Um, we took about a week and we surveyed the entire length of the, the trench. Um, so the, it's, it's quite interesting. I, I've got a grant to, to look in much more detail at, at the southern, at the South Sandwich Trench. But um, in the south in particular, you get a lot of these confined basins. And that's, they're caused by, there's a number of, um, of ocean spreading centres out to the east. And of course, you've got the inherent fabric from that. You've got the fracture zones associated with that. And as that is brought into the, the subduction zone, into the, the trench axis, the sort of interplay of that sort of fabric, which is kind of at right angles to the, the trench axis coming in, you end up with all of these little confined basins. And it was in one of these confined, confined basins that, that Victor dove. But, um, you know, as a geologist, I just don't I don't necessarily care about the, the deepest point. <laughs> I, I want to look at it all. Um, so it was a great opportunity to, to look at the, the entire trench. Um, and I'll, I'll describe that a little bit later in a, in a few slides time. But um, we also surveyed the meteor deep, which is in the far north. And that was first discovered in 1926 by the, the German ship, 
meteor. And um, they were using one of the earliest sort of echo sounders. Um, I think it was actually the first time the echo sounder had been used for science. So it had been developed for sort of the navies around the world had been using it for surveying. But um, in terms of using it in anger for, for a purely research expedition, I think that was the first time it had been used. And completely by accident, they got the deepest point in, uh, in the South Sandwich Trench. And they measured a depth that was 8,264 metres. And we measured 8,265. So, I mean, they were bang on back in 1926. Makes you wonder whether we need to spend all the money. <laughs> but, but it's just, uh, I love the fact that how efficient um, uh, the Germans are. So I'm um, skipping over to um, Java, um, just really quickly. Um, again, it was it was very poorly covered by uh, by sort of more recent, up to date um, maps. Very surprising given some of the the sort of devastating uh, tsunamis and earthquakes in the region. But those have been centered. So there's been an awful lot of exploration. Um, and research done in those, but it's sort of round the corner a little bit to the north in the Sumatra Trench. So this is a sort of southern extension of that. Um, so I love the, the Java Trench. It is absolutely spectacular. The deepest place wasn't where I thought it was going to be in the death study. That's all right. You know, I don't mind getting proven wrong. But um, science was becoming a bit more important, especially when, you know, you start generating images like this. And we can see here that there's a number of seamounts coming into the trench axis, and these are being um, fractured by these bendulated faults. And some of these are, are sort of 500 meters high. Um, there's a number of seamounts. Uh, of course, there's a lot of interest in seamounts from biodiversity, ocean mixing, the impact that they have on, on subduction rates and, and the, the friction on the, on the plates and things. So um, yeah, it's, it's the trench that just keeps giving, frankly. Um, and if we look at some of the uh, this seamount, for example, it's just popped up in the in the top right. This escarpment that you can just make out there, that little cauliflower structure, um, that's uh, so. I think the head wall is is two hundred and fifty to three hundred meters high. Um, the, the sort of width of it is about five kilometers, and we've done some really preliminary um, sort of to, uh, tsunami modeling just on that one landslide. And I mean, we've mapped over 30 along the mar margin. So we're going to do tsunami modeling for them all. Um, and that was tsunami genic. It would have generated a tsunami that would have impacted across the Indian Ocean. So and that's just some of our initial runs. There's an awful lot of caveats on that initial run. There's an awful lot of work that needed to sort of feed in to, to better constrain some of those models. But it's all very sort of early, sort of hot off the press. But um, yeah, I mean, it's it's very interesting. Of course, before somebody asks, chronology is an issue. We don't have the, the chronology for these, but at least it'll be a, a stepping stone, I hope, for other researchers to go back and hopefully do some nice targeted sampling, and then we can start to get a better hold on, on when some of these um, events occurred. Um, just some uh, screenshots from the submarine dive and, and, you know, the deepest octopus ever found and the stopped Skidian in the, in the bottom right hand corner. But in terms of geology, um, what I'm working on just now and um, hopefully get that submitted in the next sort of few weeks. So it is a bit sort of, again, hot off the almost press. It's not quite there yet, but um, looking at if, if you sort of get your eye in, you start to see in some of these rocky areas, um, this is actually a dive that went up one of these bend related faults. You start to see sort of jagged sort of edges and things. And so we're looking at the jointing planes, which have formed this inherent weakness in the rocks that's being exploited by fluids, that's then feeding sort of chemosynthetic bacterial communities, which are all the sort of bright oranges and reds and, and yellows and whites that you're seeing in these, um, in these images. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting um, from, from that sort of point of view, also in terms of um, habitat stability. So I'm working with biologists who are looking at habitat stability and how frequent, I'm trying to get a handle on how frequent some of these surfaces might fail um, to see what the turnover in the, in the habitat might be and how long it might take to, to sort of recolonize some of these um, faces. That's kind of work that's, that's ongoing just now. I realize at times I'm um, uh, bashing on a little bit, 
The Marianne and Tonga trenches, I won't spend too much um, time there, although Tonga is super interesting. The Mariana, because it's the deepest, everybody goes there. Everybody goes to the deepest point. So we had a really good sort of control before we went there about what we were going to find. So it was a little bit boring. But places like Box C on that um, top right hand corner, that's Serena Deep. And we managed to get some, uh, some science done there. So it's not the deepest point. It's only, it's only about 10,700 metres. But I'll show you some screenshots shots in a second from that, that work. And again, Tonga, it is shallower than Challenger Deep. Um, I've not managed to work up this data too much yet, so I wouldn't dwell too long on it, but it's, it's really interesting. It's really interesting. Um, the final stop on the journey was uh, Malloy Hole um, up in the, in the Arctic. Um, it is unusual in that it isn't a subduction trench. It's, um, it's located on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Um, the weather window was uh, an issue that uh, we, were, we were quite worried about that as we were coming up to when we were meant to be doing there. We, but luck was on our side and we managed to complete three dives up in, in the Arctic. Uh, so one for the, the deep for Victor, you know, he was very pleased. But we managed to get two dives on the, the sea mount, which is just to the north. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my arrow, but uh, just north of that sort of transect A to B, there's the bright red um, sea mount there. And that's an oceanic core complex. So they're dome-shaped features. Some describe them as looking like a turtle shell found in some of the, some mid-ocean spreading centers, uh, mid-ocean spreading ridges even, um, but ones that are pulling apart really slowly. And they're interesting for a number of reasons, um, understanding convection in the Earth's mantle, crustal processes, how ocean crust forms, uh, the, the whole process of spreading. But what I think is most interesting personally is that they've got the potential of hosting hydrothermal events. And that's what we were looking for in the two science dives. Um, we didn't find any, I mean, needle in a haystack job, but it was super cool. But um, yeah, so we'll, we'll uh, skip over um, that a little bit and come back to it in a sec. So um, just quickly, just finish up with, um, I've, I've touched upon a few sort of science um, highlights on the way. I'll just touch upon another couple. Um, we, are, we have donated all of the data that we acquired to Seabed 2030, which if you haven't heard of it, I'm sure researchers on the call of course have, but it's a really ambitious, fantastic initiative to try and map all of the world's oceans by 2030. And there's a lot of organizations and, and um, both sort of private groups as well as sort of research organizations on board with that. Um, so just the five deeps alone, we mapped over, you know, 650,000 square kilometers covered, not just the, the sort of primary trenches that we were going to. We tried to tweak the transits to try and hit as many features as we could as we went. Um, and, uh, but we've continued that work and I think we're up to over one and a half million square kilometers now, sort of since the five deeps ended. So it became the ring of fire and we went to the Red Sea and stuff as well. So, um, so that's ongoing. Java Trench, I've already um, discussed a little screenshot in the top right there of um, Tonga Trench. And um, we managed to, to go over the toe of a really quite large submarine landslide. Um, and currently sort of trying to find the time to, to look at that video a bit more. Um, but I suppose the, the sort of three images there, the sort of two on the top and the Mariana Trench dive from the Serena in the bottom left, we're seeing lots of sort of interesting colours, which to my eye and sort of doing a bit of um, uh, literature review around the subject, you know, it's indicative of something a bit chemosynthetic. Um, it is unsampled, so we don't know. So it is a little bit of conjecture. But um, I'm beginning to wonder, wonder whether chemosynthesis is all that interesting because we seem to find it everywhere. I'll just throw that in. But um, what I'm really interested in and doing, hopefully again, submit that in the next sort of month, is um, we found a relic hydrothermal vent at a depth which is about the same depth as the Shinkai Seat Field, um, which is in the Mariana Trench on the overriding plate, just sort of directly north from Challenger Deep. But this is on the underriding plate, this location in the bottom right there. And it's also, um, it's on the underriding plate um, near a, a sort of sea mount, but a comparable water depth. So we're, we're busy sort of just looking at um, sort of morphology of vent fields, um, the sort of classic sort of flange structure that we're seeing here. I mean, it's not 
not necessarily hard hitting science, but it's a really nice short communication that we're just sort of putting together. Because part of this is everything's so visual that, you know, it, it's really good to just get some of those images out there and say, you know, this is a bit weird or this is interesting. Has anybody else seen this? You know, if you're going back here, you know, this is an interesting place that maybe you could go and visit too. So I'm trying not to be, I'm not very precious about it. You know, I'd like to sort of share as much as we can. Um, I realise that, that time is going on, but we do have a, a grant to look at um, from the Darwin Initiative in the UK to look in more detail at the work in the, the South Sandwich Trench. It is part of one of the largest marine protected areas on the, the planet, but we've done a lot of detailed geomorphological mapping. And, you know, for example, we've mapped, you know, over 100 seamounts, whereas there was only two previously. And there's an awful lot of work looking at um, the biodiversity of sea mounts in the, in the sort of Arctic and, and Antarctic realms. So, I mean, even just identifying and, you know, we're, we're going to put this uh, work into the, the Journal of Maps so that it can be used by other researchers visiting these areas. And then they can really sort of not waste too much time going in blind. They can target particular features if they're wanting to. We're working with Ronnie Glud at uh, University of Southern Denmark, who's looking to sample for biogeochemical work, um, these sort of deep flat bottom basins, which are, are the sort of blues um, in that top right corner, um, the, the sort of dark blues and stuff. So, I mean, it allows him to, to really sort of pinpoint where it is that he's wanting to target without having to do an awful lot of legwork beforehand and maximize his time, um, his sampling time rather than survey time offshore. Um, I'll skip over the biological highlights. I'm not a biologist, although it, it does sort of rub off, but um, we, there was an awful lot of first, but it's also adding to the body of evidence for Hadal biologists. Um, and Alan Jameson, uh, the, the top picture there, is uh, him and his group are, are working a lot of that work up. But we did involve um, scientists from sort of over the world um, and in the five deeps as well. So that's all getting worked up. Inevitably, we did find trash. So this is hot off the press. This was, we just got this out last week. Um, um, there's a number of exploration vehicles that are now using single use plastic coated tether. And at the end of those missions to some of the deep areas, um, part of the design of that vehicle is that they jettison them, they discard them. So they're, they're deliberately single use, one shot things. And, um, and when we, we've done, oh gosh, I've lost track of how many dives we've done in the Mariana now. Um, Victor loves it, so he keeps going back. But, um, but due to its composition, these fiber optic tethers, they'll not only persist, persist environmentally, but you know, we're finding them, the bottom two images there, the, some of these tethers are in span. They're sitting off the sea floor in the water column. I mean, close to the seabed, but you know, that's a risk to unmanned craft, you know, ROVs, AUVs, the Chinese have got a really nice AUV that they're working on just now. Woods Hole are developing a new one, you know, as well as, I mean, gosh, you know, if you got tangled in that in a submarine, could you guarantee that you get home? You know, it's, it's a bit, it's really, really sad. Um, and just to, I've got, I think, two, one more slide. Um, I managed to do a submarine dive to uh, the Malloy Seamount. Um, I went down to 2,500 metres. And geologists are very visual people. And the moment where, you know, the sonar is reading, right, okay, we're 150 meters off bottom, 100 meters off, off, off bottom, looking out the portholes and seeing the seafloor coming up, that first moment is just indescribable. It's the third best moment in my life after the birth of my children. Just, you know, it's just fantastic. So, um, and having the ability to work with the pilot and direct where I was wanting to make observations on this seamount um, was is just fantastic. And I mean, obviously, I just grinned for the entire trip and, you know, for days afterwards. Um, there's a fair few cocktails drunk that night anyway. Um, so just to, to conclude, um, I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't read all of that that text, but, you know, understanding more about the deep oceans is crucial for, I mean, huge numbers of reasons, you know, regulation of global climate, better understanding of biogeochemical cycles, insight into hazards from submarine landslides or, or um, such like, um, providing invaluable baseline data as human exploration for, you know, not just sort of uh, 
sort of blue skies research, but raw material and, and such like, as they progress into, into ever deeper waters, you know, we need to sort of at least be able to have a measure of what was what it was like before. And um, yeah, and I mean, humans have had a, a relationship with the maritime environment, environment for as long as humans have been around, you know, so it's, it's important that we, that we maintain that. So um, yeah, many, many people, it's not just me, it's all a, a group team effort. So thanks very much to everyone that makes it possible and also works on the research afterwards. And um, thanks very much. Yeah, so I'll stop there. Sorry, I ran over a little bit. Hope, um, uh, stop share. Turn on my video again. Thank you, Heather, for this very, as always, enthusiastic um, presentation. And actually, I think we, we, we have the pleasure to have then not only the deepest Scottish person here on board, but maybe also the deepest uh, Flemish person here uh, uh, online. Isn't it, Mark? Yep. The deepest person, so two deepest persons. Please uh, all enjoy this moment. So um, are there any burning questions? I, I think there may be a lot of burning questions. So please shoot. Mark? Hi, Heather. Uh, really, thanks for the very nice presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, probably you mentioned it at a certain point, uh, but I, I missed it. So um, how does the passenger fit into this Triton? Because it looks like a, it looked like a vertical construction. So you essentially get in there standing up? Yeah, so um, the the submarine is sort of lifted off the boat and then it's brought against the stern. So then you step onto the top of it. I mean, the whole thing structure, I think, is three metres high or three and a half metres high. Um, you have to climb down, you know, so one at a time, um, down the, the trunk. Um, and then you have to sort of stand on the, the sort of joystick between the two seats and then you sit in your on your seat. So the pilot's always on the left. Okay. and the, the passengers on the right. You do get quite a lot of sort of training beforehand. Um, there's a lot of safety protocols and things that you have to be able to sort of cope with because there is only two of you in there. Um, yeah, so it's it's entry and exit through that um, that entrance trunk. And there's a, there's a guy called Frank who stands on the back deck and rather unceremoniously sort of gets his hand under your butt and like shoves you, helps you up onto the... the the, the top of the submarine. And then there's um, another engineer um, who's usually a guy called Tim McDonald. Um, he's up there because he's there, well, for safe boarding and and, uh, and uh, disembarking. I mean, I had lots and lots of pictures that could have shown all that, but for time. Um, but he also is there to prep the submarine sort of once the, the people are inside. So he's there to sort of seal the hatch, do all the safety checks. He, you know, once the, the sub's in the water, he removes all of the cables and the straps and the and the safety um, rails as well. So there's removable safety rails for when the passengers and the pilot are getting in and out. So, I mean, it, we've got it down quite slick. The first one was people fell in the water, but at least it's water. <laughs> but, um, you know, but now it's, it's a pretty slick operation now. No, but I, I was wondering because uh, I, I had, well, the pleasure, yes. The pleasure to, to to dive with the Mir, the Russian um, submersible. Uh, so, and this was Russian style. So we had no training whatsoever. We got shoved into the, the machine and, and thrown into Lake Baikal. But the thing is what people don't realize, it's, it is very small in there. And in the mirrors, essentially you do your observations while lying down on your belly, leaning on an elbow. And imagine having your face against that window for three, four hours, leaning on that elbow, this becomes extremely painful. So, so I, I, I understand that in, in, the, in the Triton, we get to sit in a chair. Yeah, yeah, of course. Sorry, I, I missed the, the point of your question there. Yeah, so you have your seat, which is fine, but the entire sort of inside, I think, is only yeah. 1.8 meters. But of course, you know, there's electronics underneath. So your seat is kind of already not on the bottom of that 1.8 meters so you're sat so you can't stand up and i'm what 1.8 meters so you can't stand up so your back gets quite sore it gets cold yeah, it gets course, cold even yes the surface temperature is you know if you're in the tropics you know it's like 28 degrees or something but once you're down there i mean you know 
the South Sandwich Trench is a cryogenic trench. It's actually below zero on the seafloor. Um, you know, you're, it's maybe one degree sea surface, sea temperature down there. So it does get cold as well. Yeah. But, um, but you're right, you know, the portholes are sort of there and, you know, you're, I spent the entire dive sort of bent over in the middle with my face against the porthole going, yeah, yes. ah! <laughs> <You know? laughs> but um, yeah, that, yeah, once I was getting out of the, the sub, I definitely had to sort of do some stretches and yoga and things. And there was a really funny moment where I actually, I climbed up and out of the, of the submarine and I was sort of stood with Tim leaning against one of the handrails and I couldn't walk because, of course, none of the blood had been circulating in my legs, so my legs had gone all tingly and wobbly. And so it probably looked like I was just sort of, you know, like hanging out really casual. But no, if I'd taken a step, I would have fallen over. So I was just sort of standing there for a little while, while the blood sort of went back in. And I'm sure you had the same as well, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, I mean, it's really, it's hours. Eh? It's oh. four, five, six, seven hours that you're down there in the, in the thing, yeah. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Tim. Hey, Heather. Uh, very nice to see you again. Uh, wow, amazing talk, amazing pictures. It makes uh, homeworking just that, that wee bit more painful. <laughs> um, but really uh, amazing things. Um, I especially liked a lot of the, the very nice multi-metimetry maps that you've shown. And I had just one question, like with this brand new system, as you say, what's kind of the horizontal resolutions that you're getting um, at these kinds of depths? And then uh, as my second question, um, as a geomorphologist, what was your uh, most favorite feature, geomorphological feature that you uh, discovered? Mustn't be an easy one since you did that much work, but... Uh, yeah. Gosh, um, favourite features. Um, yeah, I, I do have a bit of a thing for the bend-related faults. I mean, those massive escarpments. I mean, I've done work in the Kermadec Trench, so not related to Five Deeps. And um, and a lot of those features, I mean, they're, they're sort of 70 to 100 kilometres long. They're 500 to a, a kilometre, 500 metres to a kilometre high. And I mean, that's not just a one sheer cliff. You know, that is sort of smaller sections, maybe... 100 meters high and then a little plateau 100 meters high a little sort of step but I mean they're they're truly awesome I mean they're they're pretty cool and so I'm doing a, a bit of work trying to map these around all of the trenches that I've now been to to see whether I can do some sort of comparison between geographic location changes in subduction style and rates and stuff but that's kind of all inside my head just now I haven't started writing it uh, so yeah, it's probably my favourite feature. The EM124, I mean, it, it did really, really well. Um, uh, but I mean, in terms of vertical resolution, deepest places, we're probably getting plus minus, you know, an error margin of maybe between five metres and 15 metres. Um, we had the luxury of actually being able to use um, full ocean depth sound velocity profiles for the correction. So um, instead of using anything that's modelled or is only based on, you know, like the upper kilometre or something, because the landers that we were using and the submarine all had CTD, so uh, conductivity, temperature, depth, and you can use that to generate um, a velocity model and a velocity profile for, for the full ocean depth. So we had a really good um, ability to correct the data when we were processing it for, for velocity. Um, so yeah, I think overall we were we were getting better results than, than many people surveying these deep sea areas because they don't necessarily have the, the full ocean profile for the, the velocity correction. Um, I mean, the, the swath width, I mean, that varies with, with water depth, but I mean, yeah, performed pretty. It, in terms of the, the coverage varying with water depth, I mean, you know, no different to one, two, two. I mean, it is what it is. But um, I think the, the vertical correction and the vertical resolution that we could get was, was better because we, but mainly because we had the ability to apply a really accurate velocity model. Thank you. Uh, very impressive stuff. Uh, and very nice to see also uh, putting my EMOPnet hat on. Very nice to see that uh, it's planned, all this data is planned to be released openly uh, for CBAT 2030. So that's, that's actually very impressive. Yeah, some of the 
data is already available on the BGS repository and it's all just there and open. Um, and the rest of it's with Seabed 2030 and it's also gone to NOAA as well. But of course, we've just, we've just literally dropped like 200 individual surveys, including all of the transits and everything. So they're, although we've done all of the metadata for it, you know, they, it just takes time for them to go through it and upload it into their own systems. They'll know what to do during their home office uh, time. <laughs> okay, maybe we have time for one other question because it's it's nearly two o'clock and, and maybe some, some students have to go to courses and others have to teach the courses. Um, but if there, is there another question? I have a question if I may. Yes, sure, please. Um, hello, I'm Chantal. I'm from the Oceans and Lake Programs at the University of Brussels. Thank you very much for your talk. Really very interesting to hear. Um, I have a question you might have said, uh, did you also take samples on the dives? And if you did, because I'm interested in pollution, are they also being analyzed for pollutants like microplastics and pops and other pollutants? Um, yes, yeah, so lovely, lovely to hear from you. And I, um, what a great question. So um, a lot of the, the we did take an awful lot of biological samples, less geology samples, because there were issues with the arm yeah, don't don't get me started. But um, the the biological samples are being worked up just now um, with with various researchers. And yes, there are finding they are finding microplastics. Um, but that, to be honest, that didn't surprise us necessarily. There have been a number of studies now looking at um, tissue samples, for example, from a number of the fish and the amphipods from the deepest places in the world. You know, Kermadec. Um, and Mariana and I think it was New Hebrides as well. There was a really good published study a couple of years ago. And they found not only um, microplastics, but they found persistent organic pollutants. Mm. And they found, you know, flame retardants mm -hmm. that had been banned in the 80s it, within those, those tissues. You know, so these are, you know, these are chemicals that accumulate in in the sort of body tissue and then of course they get eaten by other other animals and they accumulate it you know so and there's also just been a new species described from the Mariana Trench and it's you know I, I forget what the first part of it is called it's a species of amphipod it's like Hirondelia or Baticolosoma or something but the second part of the the Latin name is Plasticus mm. because it's a completely new species never been described before never been captured before and it already has plastic. So in terms of me bashing on about um, having baseline data so that we can record change, that boat has sailed, <laughs> forgive the pun, in yeah. terms of recording <laughs> some of that change, especially when it comes to the biological communities and populations. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I have one final question. How many papers do you plan to publish from this? Oh, just don't, don't, like. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that will not be for your PhD because your PhD will be glacial platforms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I also want a job as well so, <laughs> for the British Geological Survey. So, um, yeah, there's, so we've got, I think we've got three papers in review just now. We've managed to get out four or five so far. And the list of papers, just five deeps, is massive. I've been involved in a couple of European projects um, called Hades, and um, and it was a Europe, there was a European Eurofleet cruise that I had down to the South Shetlands. Again, I just yeah, please don't. <laughs> yeah, but okay. This, but this is this is the interesting things, and maybe a little bit different from the PhD, where it's very much a, a sort of almost well an independent body of research. You know, the, the sort of five deeps and some of the other subduction trench works. I very much had to um, learn a little bit, but also it's sort of it's been great to work with the wider community. And whenever your your student cohort come to to be publishing a lot more use your co-authors you know that, that would be my biggest bit of advice and it took me a long time to do that i used to think that oh well i'm first author oh god i have to only be circulating a really polished piece of work no get the draft out really quick send it around your co-authors you know they are they are there for a reason and um and yeah we're, we're getting 
quite a lot of momentum going with all of the trench work just now and, and there's a lot of publish, publications just churning out just now. But there's just not enough hours in the day. I think that's some very good advice to the PhD students being present here. Um, and had it also, yes, well, now I know something to add to my list of cunning plans is uh, with the new Belgica to, to team to team up with you and uh, maybe also try to do some deepest dives in Europe or something. We'll see. Heather, once again, many, many, many thanks for this very enthusiastic talk. And I hope to see you very soon again and to share a good pint of whatever beer that we'll be drinking in, probably in Edinburgh. But once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Hope to be again, again soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.